Hey, my name is Brent here on Cloudy with the Chance Meatballs. Welcome to Ideas, a time where we sit down with publishers, designers, illustrators in the board game hobby and find out how they got their ideas from just ideas to the board games that we love to play. And I believe that community is built on conversation, just like games are built on ideas. And today we have, in the space of, I guess, developing and publishing, we have Matthew Ryan of Envy Born Games. How's it going, Matthew? Hey, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the intro. Things no are problem. going well. I'm happy to be here. Right on. And so, you know what? I'm just, I just dive into these things all the time. Um, I just want to talk about board games. And that's what we're here. Yeah. And we're going to talk about how you got into publishing. But obviously, before publishing, you probably played a game or two, whether it be childhood, you know, adolescence, like teens or college age or whatever. But what does that journey look like for you? Did you always play games growing up as a kid? Um, so growing up, I mostly played like video games, but I also mm -hmm. played board games as well. Um, I actually was fortunate enough when I was, I think, 12 or 13, my grandparents took me to Germany because we have an aunt and uncle who live over there and a cousin. Mm -hmm. And they actually introduced me to Catan there before it was in the States. Wow. And they, I loved it. They taught me how to play it while I was there. And then I had them write out the rules in English for me. Mm -hmm. And I brought them back to the U.S., but then nobody wanted to play it. So I just, <laughs> you know, played video games. But... I played a lot of Risk growing up, too, in my family, mm -hmm. which uh, led to a lot of different fights and arguments amongst <laughs> us. But, um, yeah, I, you know, I would play board games, like, on and off. Um, but mainly it was, like, video games on my PlayStation growing up, for the most part. I used to love, like, Final Fantasy and stuff like that. Okay, you say PlayStation. Let's talk, let's talk about video games for a little bit. So, PlayStation, like, that was, like, PS1 for you, PS2. Like, where, oh, yeah. where are you? I got them that? all. Okay. Okay. I, so I which got Final PS1 Fantasy? and PS2. I actually um, slept outside of Walmart for like four days to get the PS3 when that came out. Mm. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of when I stopped actually. Like I got a PS, my brother got one and like, I don't really play. If I play games now, it's like on the switch or the computer basically. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as far as Final Fantasy went, I think, at the time, I loved Final Fantasy VIII, which is, like, kind of weird, but I never beat it. Squall. I loved I Final well. Fantasy VII, but I never beat it. What I, I always get to the end of a video game, and I get sad about the idea of beating it. Mm. So, like, <laughs> I never beat it. Um, and then I was obsessed with Final Fantasy Tactics as well, which was mm -hmm. amazing. I loved that game. Seven is the cl is cloud and eight is oh, squall, yeah. squall, right? Is that the... Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I think it's Squall. He's got, like, the gun blade or... Mm -hmm. or yep. the sword with the gun or whatever but right on yeah i my brother played final fantasy 7 and 8 and whatnot i'm more of a nintendo guy um just got mario wonder for the switch for my boy's uh birthday so we've been playing that that game's nice that game's wild but i've been um, playing the um the mario kart on the switch with the some of my roommates lately nice <laughs> have fun doing that <laughs> yeah, we I just bought the upgrade pack, so 96 races, like that's just crazy for Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Um I'll have to but check that out. Let's shift gears. No um no pun intended, but did you have you, you say you played Risk growing up? Did you have a favorite game like or do you um yeah, like besides Risk, did you have a, a like a favorite game or I mean, I was always up to play whatever game people mm -hmm. wanted to but i think growing up i you know i was very much mainly in that mainstream gaming only you know mm -hmm. i wasn't really exposed to the hobby games besides Catan when i went to germany yeah but then nobody like ever wanted to play it so people were like let's play you know monopoly mm -hmm. or risk or clue and i'm like okay mm -hmm. we're sorry <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's very much in that mainstream didn't even know really about how big this other you know hobby i mean it's grown significantly since then but mm -hmm. you know i was getting like you know i was getting like pokemon cards and stuff with my <laughs> friends back then or magic right. cards and stuff so so what are you playing these days obviously you're um a designer or sorry a developer and a publisher but clearly surely you're playing other people's games as well like what's hitting the table recently for you 
the only game I ever play is Gnome Hollow. Go get it now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was paid to say that by Ammon Anderson. I bet you you were. I bet you were. <laughs> um, uh, I go. I play whatever people want to. I'm I'm pretty chill when it comes to gaming. Um, I go to all the conventions, but I'm usually vending, so I'm mm-hmm. not playing games with people often. But I have a Wednesday game group I go to, and whatever people want to play, if they have a spot, I'll be like, yeah, I'll play. I think mm-hmm. last week I played, what was it? Uh, I got crushed in it, too. Um, oh, man, I'm brain farting. It'll come back to me, like, in, like, 10 minutes. But anyways, at the Wednesday group, I'll play whatever. And then um, we have people over on Sunday sometimes, and I'll play games then as well. And it's really just whatever anyone wants to, like... There's very few games that I don't like or hate, mm-hmm. and I'm willing to play pretty much any game genre or category. I'm mm-hmm. open to it, and then if I don't like it, I just won't play it again. Right. Yeah, so. I, I, I guess you kind of learn as a as a, a publisher kind of what other publishers are doing. Obviously, you see it, right? But you see what other games are out there, and like whether it's your cup of tea or not you kind of I, I would imagine you kind of learn to what you yeah. want in a game yeah i mean that's almost kind of it too like sometimes people are like i don't know sometimes i almost feel like i'm like it's work when i'm playing a game i have mm. to like really kind of shut it off where i'm like uh because i also play test a lot of games that are pitched to me mm. um so like that's work you know but yep. i try and switch gears when i go to a game night or something like that but yeah i also feel like i just in general, it's better for me as a publisher to be open to like all types of gaming to see what's going on, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm not going to say the games I don't like, but there's very few ones and I'm just like, no. And some of them are games that people really like too. So it's name one, fun. name one. Please. I don't want to. Wanna... <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm not a fan of um, uh, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Line. No, okay. I like. I will say this, my, my gaming style is like 30, 60 minutes, not necessarily theme, whatever. You can kind of see a whole bunch right. of different themes behind me, but that time frame per se. And Jaws Line's a little bit longer. Pardon? I see that Shadows over Camelot behind That's a nice one. <laughs> yeah. That's a little bit longer. <laughs> it, it is. It is. And like Clank uh, Catacombs can be a little longer. Everdale obviously can be longer um, depending on player count and, and whatnot. Um, but that that's a game that's obviously wildly popular, like top yeah. 15 on BGG. And I'm like, I think, I think at that point it's the game or sorry, it's me, not the game. Like, yeah. it's just well, not for me. Dungeon crawls are like boring, boring, boring to me. I, so I played several campaigns of Gloomhaven with some friends and, um, I, it, it's fine enough. I just was like, I'd rather, and I know they're different too, but I'm like, I'd rather just go play D and D. <laughs> that was kind of like how I felt with it. Yeah. Uh, but people love it, obviously. So good on them. But I guess the most one that is kind of more recent that I just didn't enjoy playing was Paint the Roses. Okay. Um, so that was one that I didn't necessarily care for, but there's a lot of other people who like it. And that's I like when people like things. I'm not gonna yuck on anyone's yams, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy that you're happy about it. Like Absolutely. that's cool. I like seeing people happy and enjoy things. Right on. So let's talk about design. Or I keep saying design work, but you did start with designing, and and now you develop games, and now you publish games. But let's let's go into that um, that journey into starting Envy Born Games. Um, what made you think a number of years ago that hey, I can I can publish my own games and make a living on it? That would be ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. So. I lived in Vegas for a long time and I bartended. So I was very much in the food and beverage industry and worked all the clubs and stuff like that. And like we kind of talked about earlier, I used to like playing video games and board games growing up. And I just was like, I want to kind of try and do something for myself. Like it'd be cool to make a game. And I was like, I, well, I don't know how to program, so I'm not making a video game. <laughs> right. And then um, I was like, but I think I could probably figure out how to make a board game, you mm-hmm. know? So I just kind of went online and started Googling stuff a little bit. And the first version was like 
on a pizza box basically with like sharpies and stuff that i drew out and then it was on like a cardboard paper with markers so it got upgraded a little bit but <laughs> i was just like i'm gonna try and do a drinking party game uh, okay. and that's how don't get drunk came because i was a bartender so i kind of wanted to mix that world with the gaming world um and when i was going online and asking questions or in different facebook groups it was like and this was 2016 when i started it it was like way more like taboo to be doing like party drinking games and stuff like it was like frowned upon you know like people were like don't do it it's stupid like you're dumb for even trying and i'm like all right cool well i'm gonna do it anyways you know <laughs> Uh, since then, I feel like it's a bit more friendly uh, as far as like that genre of game going, especially like party games, not necessarily like drinking ones, but party mm -hmm. games in general. Um, and then I, I just I really didn't know what I was doing. I was just kind of making mistakes and learning as I went. And then I ended up launching it on Kickstarter in 2018, probably made every mistake you could make <laughs> launching a Kickstarter, somehow fund it. <laughs> um, and then uh, kind of just went from there. But to start, I just like each day I would just kind of be like, because when you're starting off, you don't know everything that's involved with publishing a game. So I, I self self published my first design, basically. Mm -hmm. And you learn as you go. And like each day I was just like, all right, let me just focus on this. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to learn what ocean freighting internationally mm -hmm. is. Like, what is that? Mm -hmm. And then I just spent the day learning about that and what it was and how it worked. Um. Because if you start looking at everything all at once, it's so easy to get overwhelmed to the point where you're like, oh my God, what am I doing? And just freeze and not do anything. So I would mm -hmm. try and break things up as they came to me and figure them out. Uh, and that's kind of what I did. And again, there's a lot of different Facebook groups and websites and stuff like that that I was kind of getting inf information from at the time. Um, and I went through all that to self-publish my first game. And then... I was like, kind of learned I wasn't like the best designer because I started to get more into like the hobby side of gaming at that point. Right. Uh, and I was like, yeah, this is, I made a roll and write, a roll and move drinking game. You know, mm -hmm. it's like an adult candy land. So I'm like, okay. designing isn't necessarily my strong point, but I went through the publishing process, which is a lot of work and you got to wear every hat possible and learn all kinds of things. So it gave me like a skill set that not, you know, everyone has, uh, mm -hmm. it was like trial by fire kind of thing. And even now I'm still learning as I go, but, um, I was like, let me focus on the publishing and then have designers. I'll work with designers since I already went through this and no one wants to do this part because it's the unsexy part, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of how MB born became what it, mm -hmm. what it is. And now you kind of moved into like a, a tiny box, a mi micro box. Like would that, would, would that be accurate that that's kind of your, niche or like yeah what you're kind of going for you know yeah. in a in, in a world with like giant games with like ridiculous box sizes and like upgraded components that are like through the roof and whatnot yeah. you're kind of on the other end of the spectrum saying like hey you know what we can actually come up with some like really fantastic games and experiences and a lot of joy in a tiny box is that yeah, so true, right? How that, yeah, I would say that is definitely now it is. Um, in between me doing my first game and then kind of really focusing on MB Born full time, which was like really like mid 2022, mm -hmm. I started working for like a different publishing company that doesn't exist anymore. Okay. And I learned all the things not to do basically. So fast forward and then I started working. I'm like, I'm just going to do this on my own. And uh, I was very much in the mindset that I was like, I think the age of the big box game is on the out. Like, I think people are going to get fatigued here um, because it's just, they're so expensive. They're so bulky. There's a new one every month. People can't keep up with them. The shipping's insane. Everyone's always mad when the shipping time comes. Mm -hmm. um, and I was starting with Emmy Born again, and it was like, well, I was doing party drinking games, so nobody even the, in this industry really knows my company. I actually started with a game called Mind Your Business, which is a great game, right. but it was a little bit bigger than the tiny game box. And that was a smaller game. But after that campaign is really when I was like, I think a way that I can build more rapport and clout within the industry and trust is if I put out like a bunch of smaller games that they're not going to take me two, three years to develop like the larger games. 
and I can still put out a quality product and build trust with the community and show them like, hey, this is me, I'm doing this. And then it, it just really started to develop into like, oh, I want to just continue on this line and keep doing tiny games because I really liked the idea of working on different mechanism games with different mechanisms and different themes. So like they all have different mechanisms right now and they all have pretty unique themes. I, I like unique themes when it comes to board games. Um, mm -hmm. I, I people often ask me like, what kind of theme? I'm like, as long as it's unique, I don't want, not that there's anything wrong with pirate games, but I don't want to make the 10,000th pirate game is what I tell people a lot of the time. Like I yeah. like unique themes. So that's why I have this one behind me. This is actually, this was in development before we decided like, Hey, let's start doing the tiny games, but it's called Kalahari and it's a bigger box game. Not, not huge or anything. Like it's like the side of the Cascadia maybe. Mm -hmm. And, um, that game's about meerkats. And I was like, mm -hmm. I love it. Meerkats? Like, cool, let's go. Like, there's no meerkats games out there. I want to do it. Yeah. Um, so I like unique themes. And uh, yeah, I'm very much now in the mindset of, I have several tiny games in the works and development that are signed with different designers that will be announced. But that's going to kind of be my focus moving forward is kind of the tiny game box or tiny game series line. Um, and I think you're going to see... I think you're going to see a lot of other publishers start doing tiny games as well, to be honest. You know what? And I think they're going to be hot. I think they're going to have, I think they're going to be on the wave up for the next couple of years. And it's interesting you say that because, you know, as much as like, I guess I'm in the, the review space and whatnot, I, I'm also a consumer of these board games as well. And like you said, like there's so many companies and I'm, this isn't a shock to companies. This is just, you know, People are wanting blinged out games. Let's be honest, right? Like people, oh, yeah. they're wanting glorified toys for adults, right? I'm one of them, right? I'm upgrading all sorts of my games with different components and 3D printed things and whatnot because it's cool. It's it's You're playing with different things. It kind of brings us back to the time when we maybe didn't have all the stress in life and, you know, we could just yeah, play. Yeah. Yeah, it's that, it's that escape, exactly. And so I've often wondered, you know, where is that breaking point? Because, you know, just today I saw a Kickstarter and the funding goal is like $40,000. You know what I mean? Like a funding goal for back when, you know, you did your first game or even like, you know, 2018. Funding goals weren't necessarily that high, but they're they're really that high. And it's like so flooded of a market. Yeah. I've often wondered, you know, where is that breaking point? Because consumers only have so much money. Yeah. I think it's really, with that in mind, I think it's really important to try to continue to grow the industry. Like that's one thing I would love to see happen is more and more people continue to come to the hobby and understand that there's more games than just Monopoly and Clue. And I think we're very much, I think that's very much happening now. You're starting to see that with, Barnes and Nobles carrying more games and targets and Walmarts mm -hmm. and stuff. So it's like, it's happening, but slowly. So mm -hmm. I want to see more people come because you're completely correct. When you say it's saturated, I mean, I think 6,000 new board games come out every year mm -hmm. and 2000, an additional 2000 expansions as well for previous mm -hmm. year's games. So it's like, if the hobby doesn't continue to grow with the amount of board games that come out every year, no one can keep up, No, you know? Right. And that's why I think with the tiny games too, I think people are going to start to like them and prefer them because A, people just don't have the time to play a two, three hour game. B, they can kind of take it anywhere they want and play a quick game of it. And, and like the learning curve is low, mm -hmm. you know, there's just so many things that, you know, do you want to learn, spend an hour or two hours learning a game to play at once? You know, because that's what happens. You get it to the table, you play with your group. And then, you know, if you play it a second time, that's like amazing. But it's usually just one and done almost, you know? Yeah, it, it kind of is. And it's kind of, it's kind of not ironic, but you, I guess, as a, as a publisher, can kind of see this. You know, people say so much, I want replayability. I want replayability. I want replayability. But if you're only playing the game, like, you know what I mean? You're buying. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to pick on Marvel United, but for an, for example, like there's like so much content from Marvel United. I, and I absolutely love the game. There's so much content. Like there's like yeah. oodles of replayability with all the combinations and stuff of like that. 
but no one's going to even like scratch the surface of the design, right? It's, it's almost as if we in the, the hobby is like, we want more, we want more, we want more, but yet we don't even play with what we have. Well, that's what I think I'm seeing. I think I'm seeing a lot of people, you know, they're getting games that they never play. So they're just collecting them or yeah. the shelf of shame or opportunity, whatever you want to refer to it as. And I think people are getting, like, I see less people are like, oh, I used to buy, you know, 50 Kickstarters a year. And now I buy like two, you know, like, mm -hmm. I think people are just kind of, there's just so many games coming out. They can't keep up. It's, there's like a fatigue level. So with a smaller game, it's like, it's less intimidating. Like, oh, this little game, it takes 15 minutes to learn and play. Okay. I can, I can do that, you know? Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's part of it. Just like you were saying, like Marvel United, there's so much to it. Like I, that's overwhelming to me. Like, I don't even want to get involved at this point, you know, that's mm -hmm. too much. And I, I, and I'm like, man, I want more characters. Like I, I, I often say that because, Hey, what happens if I play this with, with you, this and this with this bad guy or, you know what I mean? And so I find that fascinating, but it's kind of like a, like a two, a two edged sword in the sense of like, yeah. You, we want this as consumers, but then we don't even do anything. And are we collectors of games? Are we players of games? And not to say that being a collector is a bad thing at all. It's just... I would say I'm is, more right? of a collector, personally. Mm -hmm. I, so I'm always usually around people that have giant collections themselves. Mm -hmm. Or they're the ones always buying every game that comes out. Mm -hmm. Like my game group in Vegas, before I moved, we met every week... For like two years and played new games that it was very rare we played like three to four new games every week wow and uh but it was two couples and me and between that those two couples they were just getting all the games so like if i really like a game i'll get it and i keep it in shrink i'm definitely more of like a collector mm -hmm. I, i'll keep it in shrink and i'll put it in my closet and then or on you know a shelf or something i moved so everything's in a closet right now but um yeah, if I really love a game, I just buy it and keep it on shrink. Or what I do too is I buy a lot of indie publishers or first-time designers, self-design publishing and stuff like that because I like to support people, my peers as well. So like a lot of the games behind me are from friends of other indie publishers and designers and stuff like that. So, um, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, it's okay. I, I, I love it that you're supporting the, the small guys. It's kind of like where we live here um, uh, on the prairies in Canada. Like a lot, it's a lot of like shop local, like a lot of things like that. Right. Like, yeah. And so I love hearing it from you. You're kind of shopping local. You're supporting, you know, your colleagues in this. Um, but I want to speak on the Kalahari a bit. T tell me more about the game because uh with like the mirror the mirror cat like when's that coming out um what's the the timeline uh, on that so Kalahari is the timeline right now is like February 2025 uh probably a Kickstarter launch for it okay uh, so we'll probably get a landing page up and start running ads and building an email list and stuff like that up until then probably like this month or next month mm -hmm. but uh it's a game that's been in development for few years now for me um it's the same designer from the game sirens i published and mind your business so okay that's art casey he's a friend of mine and we work well together on games so this was one of the bigger ones um but it's a it's an area control meerkat game where you're you're taking on the role of a meerkat queen because meerkat societies are matriarchies okay. so you're trying to secure the most valuable spots in the kalahari through area control uh, and then you have a set of like bonus actions on your board that you can take and stuff like this. But it it has a really fun um, dice allocation mechanism to it, which okay. is telling you how many meerkats you can put and where. But I've been running a lot of like TTS demos for it and stuff like that, and people love it. So it's been getting really uh, positive feedback from whenever I show people it on TTS. And I'm actually going to have the like near finish official prototypes uh, for Gen Con in time for Gen Con. Right on. Um, so probably be running a few demos of that, showing it off a bit, but it's a beautiful game. Um, the art's fantastic in it. Ammon actually came on board as the art director 
and um, he worked with the illustrator Gabby, who's super talented, and really enhanced the art. And then Ammon also did all of the graphic design for the game. So hmm. we've been working on that together over the last month or so. And I'm just I'm just really happy with how it looks, and I can't wait to see what people think once we get to a uh, uh, Gen Con with it. Um, that's fantastic. So, and this is this question is going to dovetail. We got a few minutes left here. Um. How do you know when the game's done? And I've asked this to different designers, but um, you know, I'm getting it from the other side. And often they're like, when the publisher says it's done or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like for for you as a publisher, you're calling this you're calling the shots here. How do you know when the game is done? Because you could bring it to a hundred different people, and they could all say, "I like this, 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 this," but I don't like this. Yeah. And you could have a hundred different people say they like all these things and then each one of them say something they don't like and you as a publisher are are the one that's you know signing on the dot line this game yeah. is done put it to production how do you make that call when do you make that call well uh whenever i sign most games there's usually a level of development that's still required so i very I will work as closely with a designer once they sign a game with me to develop it to where it needs to be and i usually will let them know Hey, I like this. There's potential. I think we need to develop more. If you're okay with that, I'm still happy to sign this, but just want you to understand changes will be made. Um, but in the sake of like Kalahari, I've been running demos for that for a very long time. And you start to get some consistent feedback from people, you know, or you'll change. What I'll do is I'll change one thing and see how it happens in the play test, you know, and then I'll, I'll, I'll see if how it was received and stuff like that. But you kind of have to have an idea of like what the game, what you want the game to be is mm -hmm. get feedback from people, fine tune it through multiple play tests. If anything's broke, fix it. But like, I want this to be an area control game, you know, where majority wins and there's no combat in it. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody's like, well, I think they should have guns and be shooting each other. I'm like, okay, well that's thank you for the information. But it's like, my vision of what this is, which I usually share pretty closely with designers because I like bringing their vision to life because I feel mm -hmm. like that makes a better product a lot of the time, mm -hmm. um, isn't meerkats with machine guns. So we're just right. going to like <laughs> ignore that piece of feedback, you know, and sometimes I, I'm very close to the games. You can kind of take all feedback, but, you know, you'll start to learn some feedback maybe the player just didn't really get the game or understand mm -hmm. the view and they'll give you feedback or say this is broke or that and you're like it's not you just aren't grasping it and that's okay you know yeah. if it was your first play or whatever but that's a big part of it and then yeah i mean eventually you just sign off and even even when like a game's on kickstarter usually i'm still making like little tiny minor changes you know i'm always testing it out but um like this one like I would say it's done, but maybe we make a few tweaks here and there, you know, just, but we, we've been working on this for the last two years. <laughs> so wow. it's quite the journey to say the least. Yeah. But I, like I said, all the feedback has been really positive from everyone. So, well, the theme, you know, mere, meerkats are like, whatever. Uh, I love the animal. And it's really cool how you've kind of brought that in and like area control and like, you know, it's because, so thematic with the mechanisms. Yeah, thinking of the thematic a a aspect of that, um, I'm intrigued to say the lay to say the least. So I'm excited to see where this goes. And so as we wrap up here, if someone wants to know more about Envy Bone Games, where how how can they find their work? Um, not, all your small games that you're buying that you're selling, and whatnot. Um, they want to know more about these tiny games and stuff like that. Um, I'm not you, telling them. You're yeah. not telling? Okay. They can Google it. <laughs> um, so basically all of my social medias are MV born games. That's N V E N V Y born games. Okay. So that's our Instagram, our Facebook page, our, um, uh, TikTok, which I'm mostly on TikTok and Facebook. And then I'll paste post stuff on Instagram after it's already been on like TikTok or something like that. We have a website as well, mvbornegames.com. Um, so yeah, just just search MV Born Games and you'll find us sooner or later. Right on. So I'll pull post a link to all those or 
a list to your website in the description of this of this interview. And awesome. um, man, th this time has like flown by. That's crazy. It's over and already. Oh, I know it's it's crazy. <laughs> and you know, I, I just want to thank you for taking the time because I think for those that are just getting into the uh, the publishing space, I think you gave some insight as to some of the things that maybe you have learned over the last almost decade. Yeah. Um, my, so my TikTok actually has a lot of information as like, Hey, if you're a publisher, do these things or mm -hmm. don't make these mistakes. So I try and be as helpful as I can to people mm -hmm. um, because I don't want them to make the same price to eat mistakes that I did. Right. So if you are new to publishing, you should probably follow my TikTok or reach out and ask any questions. I'm always happy to answer those. Absolutely. That's fantastic. So again, thanks so much for taking the time there, uh, Matthew. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was this, you really did fly by. No, like this is like we just started. I know. I, I feel, I feel the same way. And so I guess conversation is the best that way. Right. Because it's just chatting about board games and things that we love. And that's fantastic. So check out envy born games, uh, all, all their stuff and their tiny boxes and the things that are coming out and follow them and whatnot. Um, and yeah, I firmly believe that uh, community is built on conversation, just like games are built on ideas. So until next time, grab your umbrella. The forecast is cloudy with the Chance Meeples.